Good morning, church. We are so glad that you are here this morning. Uh, my name is Chris Copeland, and I'm on staff here, and we are thrilled to have you here. There's a Connect card in the chair back in front of you. We encourage you to take that, fill that out, drop that in the offering plate, or there's a QR code where you can send that in as well. We would love to have record of your attendance today. We'd also love to be able to pray for anything that you have going on uh, in your life. And again, we are, are so glad that you are here uh, this morning. We also get the opportunity as a church family to, uh, to say our vision statement each week, so let's do that at this time. Reaching out to transform lives by extending God's love to all. Let's begin this morning with scripture. Philippians 4, 6 through 8 says, Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, my, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there be any, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's begin with worship this morning. Would you join me in our call to worship this morning? Faith never comes easy. Thomas, a faithful disciple of Jesus, doubted the post-resurrection appearance and needed to see Jesus for himself. How we are like Thomas, we sometimes think we need to see in order to believe. How blessed are the ones who, never having seen, yet have come to believe. Open our hearts, Lord, this day to absolute faith in you that although we have not seen the risen Christ, we may believe fully in him. Amen. Would you please stand and let's sing the hymn, Trust and Obey. In the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no to trust and obey not a burden we bear not a sorrow we share but 
better toil he doth richly repay, not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no to trust and obey, but we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we pray for the favor He shows, for the joy He bestows, or for them who to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at His feet or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do where He sends we will go never fear or Trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Every week we have the opportunity to share what we believe by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You This morning we have the privilege of welcoming Sherman family, Kyle, Natalie, come bringing their daughter, Campbell, for holy baptism. Brothers and sisters, here's my address to you. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated in God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift, offered to us without price. I present before you, Campbell Sherman, for baptism. Natalie and Kyle, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the forces of wickedness, the evil powers of this world, 
and, play, and repent of your sin? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, profess her faith openly, and lead a Christian life? I do. Now, to the congregation, I ask you, do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child who is now before you in your care? With God's help, we proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Campbell with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow up in the trust of God and be found faithful in her service to others. We will pray for her that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Now I invite you to join me as we give thanks over the water and ask God's blessing upon it. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark water and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. And after the flood, you set in the cloud a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them forth to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you have promised. Join me in response. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all the nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and the one who receives it to wash away her sin, to clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in Christ's final victory. All, All praise, praise to you, you eternal, eternal Father, Father, through your Son, Son Jesus Christ, Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Pass it down. Thanks. Oh, this is my favorite part. Hi, sweetie. You're so sweet, I might not give you back. Okay, when, you, when, when it's time to change a diaper, I'll give you back. Campbell. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O oh, gracious God, anoint this child with your Holy Spirit. Bless her family, especially her mom and her dad. Keep them in your care all the days of their life. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you, Campbell, that being born of the water and of the Spirit, you may be faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, and all the people of God say, Amen. Now, it is our joy to welcome our new sister in Christ. Would you respond? Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Now, many of you probably know Natalie grew up in the church, in this church. Kyle comes to us from another Christian denomination. He's already a baptized Christian, but he comes with his family to become a part of this congregation. So, Kyle, I ask you, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care the Sherman family, whom we this day receive into membership of this congregation. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Would you respond with me? 
We rejoice and recognize you as members of Christ Holy Church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that, surrounded by steadfast love, you may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to eternal life. Last thing before we conclude this part of the service is we present you with the baptismal candle for Campbell. One suggestion is that you might light it on her birthday, and as she grows older, remind her of this day as she grows in her own faith. Now may the blessings of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit keep you and your family now and forever. Amen. You have put on Christ, in Christ you have been baptized. Alleluia, Alleluia. My name is Bob Conswitz, and I will be your liturgist this morning. I direct your attention to the screens for the uh, people that we know of. We ask that you add them and their families to your prayer list. Now, as we enter a time of prayer, I will um, allow a, a short time of silence where we could all offer God our, our individual prayers. I will then continue with a congregational prayer, and then we'll finish up with our Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, you call us to be a people of faith, yet we are often people with doubts. We doubt that love can grow again in relationships where anger and bitterness reign. We doubt that peace can come in the world where hatred and racism reign. We doubt that hunger can be, or the hungry can be fed where despair and hopelessness reign. But you know the strength of love and the power of prayer. Help us to be faithful people of love. You know that peace is growing. Help us to be faithful peacemakers. You know that there is enough food in the world. Help us to be generous and faithful. God, we wake up in the morning and see a beautiful sunrise. At the end of the day, we see a glorious sunset. We see the purple mountain majesty and fruitful plains. We hear a baby's laugh, see a budding tree and the flowers in the field. We see you in all these things and are reminded you are with us. So this morning we pray for people here who are filled with doubts, who wonder where you exist and whether you are listening to our prayers. We pray for people who doubt the purpose of life, who face feelings of meaningless and despair. Even when we have that sinking feeling, give us the wisdom to turn to you, Lord. We want to believe, help our unbelief. Give us faith, small as mustard seed, so that we can be your faithful people, believing in your power to save, believing in your power to reign supreme, and believing that we can share this good news with everyone we meet. Now let us join our prayers with the saints that are with us and that have gone before us with the words Jesus gave us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Each month we highlight one of the missions that we wish to support with our communion offerings. These grace-filled videos are called Mission Moments. Today's Mission Moment is Golden Cross Ministries, and I direct your attention to the screens. She's a loving mother. She's an aunt and a sister. He's a doting grandfather. They always watch out for each other. And if one of them were your mom, granddad, or aunt, you'd want them cared for and have everything they need to be happy and comfortable in their retirement years. Which is our number one mission at Golden Cross Senior Ministries. Providing for the material, physical, and social needs of 2,200 seniors living in affordable Wesley Living retirement communities in this area. When I first got here, I had very few items that I could start my home with. I was sleeping on the floor on an air mattress when I first moved in. I stayed here about a couple of months before I found out about uh, Golden Cross. Golden Cross prepared me in such a way. I wasn't here even a week before they came across the door with everything I needed. And one morning I'm sleeping on an air mattress that's losing air. And uh, the very next day, you know, these people came out with a truckload of furniture and set it up for me. I got a lot of some, you know, self-pride sometimes and I just waited till they leave and just tears just started rolling, you know. I was overwhelmed. I really cried I, because I thought that the items that they brought, the household items, I, I thought that was it. But then I got a knock on the door, and there was a sofa coming through the door, and then a table coming through the door, and then my Betty, and I was just overwhelmed. I was so happy. They had this party. I think we danced, and I, I was amazed that the seniors who were on walkers and I would see in wheelchairs put those things to the side and dance. Everybody came out. People that you didn't see come out of their apartments were here in this activity center. The holiday get-togethers are a wonderful time for all of us here to be together. Before I moved in here, I was like, if the holidays would just come and go. I wouldn't really be involved with anyone or enjoying the day. But every holiday that comes up, we do something together as a group and it's enjoyable. And that's a time where people will make an extra effort to go to the community room and be together and enjoy not only each other, but what Golden Cross is doing and the fact that they have brought us together is a real benefit and a ministry in itself. Anybody's invited to our crafting class. We do it every Monday at 2, and we're, we're kind of trying to make it a place where people can just come and bring what they do, do it, and have great conversation. So we help each other, and it's just really nice to know that Golden Cross will help us to get some of the supplies that we need. Once in a while, they'd take us out on a bus trip. They took us all the way to Missouri so we'd get those. <sighs> Throw the rolls. <laughs> Throw the rolls. <laughs> we would go to the zoo, and I was like a kid on the bus waving at everybody, and we just had fun. Places like Golden Cross is needed, desperately needed in this community because there are a lot of hurting people out there, people that don't think anybody cares. If the ministry of Golden Cross were not here, there would be quite a void. A lot of things would be missing. Community, connection with each other, as well as with what they do. It's just a real happy thing for us all. Golden Cross helps seniors here from being so lonely. A lot of us get lonely. But I lost every one of my closest family members. And, and uh, the, um, excuse me, but I thank God for Golden Cross because of these beautiful people here and Golden Cross it got me out of my apartment. I'm getting teared up thinking about it. So many things are appreciated. Everything is appreciated here because we just don't have a lot of things that we used to have. But this adds a richness and a depth to our lives that we would not otherwise have. 
they give us a certain a certain feeling of uh, liveliness, puts life back into our day. For 25 years, we've given seniors 100% of your donations and 110% of ourselves. Thanks to your generosity and support, we'll continue ministering to them and giving them a comfortable life at home. Golden Cross helps people. Probably people would be on the street without Golden Cross's help. It's a gift. I think it's a gift. I feel very blessed here. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you to Jesus and Golden Cross. Now I direct your, your attention again to the screens for t this morning's children's movement. Hi kids, have you ever heard of Ripley's Believe It or Not? There are books like this one and museums all about strange and interesting facts. These books also include world records and all kinds of weird and fun stuff just like that. But let me show you some examples of some of the really amazing things you can find in this book. A man by the name of James Cook once had a chicken that laid a perfectly square egg. Now I've seen white eggs, brown eggs, even spotted eggs and green eggs, but I've never seen a square egg. Have you? I think I'd have to see it to believe it. Joanne Barnes was a 15 year old from California and she once swung a lot of hula hoops on her body all at the same time. How many do you think she swung on her body? 68, can you believe that? I can't even barely keep one or two hula hoops going. So I think I would have to see that to believe it. The Ripley's Believe It or Not book and their museums are filled with things that are very hard for me to believe. But do you know what? If it's true, it's true, whether or not I believe it. In today's Bible lesson, we learn that when Jesus rose from the grave, he appeared to a group of his disciples. One of the disciples, whose name was Thomas, was not with them. And when the disciples told Thomas that they had seen Jesus and that he was alive, Thomas said, I won't believe it until I see it with my own eyes. I want to put my finger in the places where the nails were on his hands and where the spear was thrust into Jesus's side. Well, guess what? Thomas saw Jesus after all, and Jesus invited Thomas to touch his hands and his side. He told Thomas to put his hands even in the wounds. And then Thomas finally believed. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There might be some people today who won't believe that Jesus really rose from the dead because they haven't seen him with their own eyes. But do you know what? I think that it's true that Jesus rose from the dead whether or not they believe it. You and I may never have seen Jesus in the flesh in person, but we do believe in him. We accept him by our faith. We don't have to see him in person to believe in him. So will you pray with me today? Dear God, thank you so much for your son and thank you for faith. Help us grow in faith and learn more about you every day. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. At this time, we want to dismiss all children third grade and under to Children's Church. You can just meet in the lobby and they will take you from there. For the rest of you, if you would please stand. Let's sing him Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. 
born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture on my sight angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Let us pray. O God of our salvation, we are witnesses to your amazing deeds. By the resurrection of your son, Jesus, you have opened the gate to eternal life. We are grateful for your gifts of forgiveness and a new start. Let the obedience of Christ, the righteous one, become the chief cornerstone of our lives. Help us to use our spiritual gifts and the monetary blessings to be a testimony to your glory. We dedicate ourselves and our offerings through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
standing for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel lesson comes from John chapter 20 verses 19 through 31. When it was evening, evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on him and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you, are, if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He then said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Jesus answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have a life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be, be seated. seated. This morning, as I was thinking over the sermon and thinking about what I wanted to say to you, I was thinking about the interesting, uh, just the interesting character of those who are particularly macho. Uh, I was thinking about macho men. I'm not, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I'm comfortable in my own skin. I'm secure enough to tell you I'm not much of a macho man. I, I, you know, there was a point in my life where I would have given anything to have been a macho man, but I, I, I finally came to terms with the fact that I'm not. One of my best friends in college was a macho man. His name's David Ryan, great big Irish boy, came from a long line of police officers who did brave and courageous things serving their communities. Uh, David became a police officer and then later went back to school and became a Methodist preacher, actually a chaplain. So this macho man now holds people's hands as they face very scary things. I think that's consistent. I think that makes sense. David was a macho man, and, and he definitely would have been one of the people I wanted if I was in a, backed up into a corner and facing difficult odds. David loved all things macho. He loved rugby. Now, I like going and watching rugby, but, I, but I'm not interested in participating in any sport that eventually gets you lined up with an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> but the world needs a few tough guys, okay? So I'm not knocking macho men. There was a tough old rancher who once told his grandson the secret to being macho and to living a long, long life. He said, grandson, the secret is, is to sprinkle a little bit of gunpowder on your oatmeal every day before you eat it. Dubious, but the grandson eventually tried it, liked it, and did it religiously for his whole life. As a result, he lived to be 97. When he died, he left behind 14 children, 27 grandchildren, 34 great-grandchildren, and a 15-foot hole in the crematorium. <laughs> the rest of you will get that on the way home. So, um, before Jesus was arrested, before he was put on trial, his disciples were talking a pretty good game, acting pretty macho. They promised that they would never turn their back on Jesus. They bragged about how they were willing to die alongside of him. They pledged their undying loyalty to him. But all of that changed when Jesus was arrested and crucified. So we find on the Sunday following the crucifixion, verse 19 says, When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of of the Jews. These tough guys, these tough guys, these macho men melted in the face of adversity. They could not stand up under the pressure. Their resolve dissolved, and it looked as if the Jesus movement was over. Have you ever been so defeated? Have you ever been so afraid, so full of anxiety, that all you could do was draw the curtain? lock the door, and pull the covers up over your head. I, for one, have been there. There have been a few days in my life where all I could do was hide from the rest of the world. The disciples were terrified for their lives. They did not have the courage to face what was next. But then verse 19 goes on to say, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. We heard about Thomas as he, as he beholds the risen Christ. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this to them, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Friends, it is still a scary world, and the followers of Jesus still have many enemies who would seek to do us harm. But the answer is also the same. This morning I want to talk to you about fear, I want to speak of anxiety, and I want to say some very clear things to you. But I also want to be very careful to make clear what I am not saying. I am not saying that if you're a good Christian, you will never feel afraid. And I'm not trying to shame you if you're currently facing something in your life that has you shaking all the way down to your foundation. I am also not trying to belittle anyone who is struggling with the real medical condition of general anxiety disorder or depression. In fact, I want to be really clear. If you're struggling with the medical condition of anxiety or depression, you need to avail yourself of every tool that is available to you to be as healthy as you possibly can be. You owe it to yourself, to those whom you love, to do whatever it takes, even if that means seeing a therapist or taking medicine. But I am this morning speaking of the very real reality that we are fragile, frail people, no matter how tough we may seem on the outside. And a part of finding the courage it takes to face the things in front of us starts with acknowledging our frailties and limitations. Psalm 103 has two of my favorite verses from all of the Scriptures. It says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are made, and he remembers that we are frail creatures of dust. The poet Winfred Ernest Garrison, in the first and third stanzas of his poem, Breton's Fisherman's Poem, Prayer, says these words, Thy sea, O God, so great, my boat so small. It cannot be that any happy fate will me befall, save as thy goodness opens paths for me through the consuming vastness of the sea. Thy world, O God, so fierce, and I so frail, yet though its arrows threat often to pierce my fragile veil, cities of refuge rise where danger cease, Sweet silences abound, and all is at peace. This morning, I want to just be very clear. I am not saying toughen up. I am not saying be macho. I am not telling you to find something within yourself. I am instead preaching the gospel, which is a radical dependence on the living Jesus. The radical dependence dependence on the risen Lord. Some of you who have been around me have noticed that I usually carry a black notebook. I carry this black notebook around. It is partially a memory aid. It's nothing fancy. I bought it for six bucks at Walmart. It's filled with empty pages that I keep a record of what I'm supposed to do, what I have done, and anything I didn't get done gets rolled over to the next day. It's part of how I try to be faithful to the things that I've promised you and the rest of the church, and especially my wife and children. Um, I call it my warrior's manual. On the very first page, I inscribed the following words. I'm speaking to myself. You cannot stand in the battle if you do not train and prepare yourself. You cannot make up for yesterday or do tomorrow's work today. God saw fit to give me another day 
what am I going to do with it? I've been doing this for a number of years. The one I'm currently carrying around has a fish on it, and some of you have asked, what is the fish about? Well, I always put things on the outside to remind me of things I'm currently going through. Uh, about, I don't know, maybe six, eight months before I left Jackson first, I knew that I would be transitioning out. My, my family and I had already started talking about that, praying about it. Sky McCracken, the senior pastor, and I had already begun to think about that and talk about it. And I put the fish on there as a metaphor for the things I was fishing for, for new opportunities, things I was exploring. And I was exploring all kinds of possibilities. And then one that I didn't see coming the bishop came through the door in September and said, what about Collierville? For me, looking at the fish now makes me laugh because I realize that I'm the fish. <laughs> the new warrior's manual that I'll start using at the end of May when Stacy and Caleb and I get back from our, our uh, trip with him for his senior year doesn't have a fish on it. It has a Polish Catholic priest on it a man who, uh, whose name was Maximilian Kobe. Before I tell you about him, I want to tell you what I wrote on the inside of this manual. And I wrote it just before my 50th birthday. In this case, I'm speaking both to myself and to Jesus as a prayer. I said, let's make number 50 amazing. Dear Jesus, I want 50 to be the best year of my life. By this, I'm not speaking about externals because I cannot control the economy, the weather, the nations, the church, or my family. But with your help, I can control my approach to this year and my responses to whatever comes my way. Teach me to be faithful. Maximilian Kobe was a Polish priest who volunteered to die in the place of someone else who was also in the Auschwitz concentration camp with him during World War II. Father Kobe was in Auschwitz because in the early 30s he had begun working against the Nazi party, which he saw even in its earliest days as a threat to Western civilization. He was arrested three times before eventually being sent to Auschwitz. Many decades later, on October 10th, 1982, John Paul II, whom I think was one of the greatest saints of the church, declared Maximilian Kobe the patron saint of our difficult century. Here's why. Maximilian Kobe was born into the dark age of chaos and uncertainty, but he found and demonstrated clarity and courage for facing the uncertain times he lived in. He did this by making a final decision about who he was in the light of who God is. By making a final decision to be loyal to God in everything that would ever happen to him, he was then able to face with courage and clarity the dark and uncertain times that lay before him. Now, I want to make something very clear. Making this kind of commitment to God does not come with any kind of guarantee about how the future unfolds. It comes only with the promise that the God who holds the future will go with us and that we will never face the future alone. Isaiah 43 says these words, Now thus says the Lord, Who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, says to you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I love how John Rippon set these words to verse in one of my favorite hymns, How Firm a Foundation. Here's how he repenned those very words. When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of woe shall not thee overflow, for I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless, 
and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathways shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Chris already read these words to you, but the apostle, the apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, for the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When I read these words, a memory from my childhood comes to mind. My siblings and I grew up swimming in the muddy waters of the Kentucky Lake. My, parent, my grandparents had a home uh, on, on that lake, and we spent a lot of time swimming and fishing and just playing in that muddy water. I remember one particular afternoon a, a storm was brewing. There wasn't yet any thunder or lightning or we would have been called out of the water, but, but, the, but the water at the surface was already becoming very, very choppy. But my sister and brother and I, we could swim like little turtles, and so we stood out there and played in that stuff. And, and I remember going deep under the waves and discovering that below the surface, it was very, very calm. In fact, the, the further down I went, the calmer the water was. And this image comes to my mind whenever I think about the peace which surpasses all understanding. The things of this world, the externals, buffet us, toss us about, yet at that deep place where our soul interfaces with God's, there is a peace which the world cannot disturb, which is why Jesus said, I give not as the world gives, Therefore, do not let your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. There is a peace which the world cannot take from us. Father Maximilian Kobe knew this as he faced the darkness of the century that lay before him. The Nazis stripped him of his external freedom and placed him in a concentration camp. But in that concentration camp, he ministered to others. He focused on prayer, and he prayed with those who were, more, who were most troubled, demonstrating to his captives that though they could hold him in a cell, they could not strip him of his freedom. They deprived him of food, providing him with only meager portions of very low-quality food. And yet Maximilian Kobe looked around for those who were weak and sick, and he shared his meager supply with them, proving to his captors that he had an eternal bread which they could not steal from him. And when those same captors chose a young Jewish man to put to death, Father Kobe remembered that he, as a celibate priest, did not have a wife did not have a child waiting back at home for him, and felt the moral courage to switch places with the man, demonstrating to his captors that though they could do a lot, though they could dehumanize, they could, they, they could brutalize, they could not strip him of his moral capacity. Again, this message is not about being macho. It is not about self-reliance. It is about a radical dependence on Jesus Christ. It is about drawing from the infinite supply of grace that the Holy Spirit gives us. This last story that I want to share with you, I've got a, I've got a preface. I, I've had to preface almost everything in, in the sermon, but I really have to preface this one because it's about teachers. And, and teachers today are under so much pressure. I don't, I don't know enough about Collierville to know if this is true here, but across the country, teachers are resigning in droves. And the, and the common reason is that in many parts of the country, teachers are not supported. They're not supported by the administrators. They're not backed up by the parents. They're facing unrealistic demands and, and being paid meager salaries. 
and are even experiencing abuse for many of their students. So I want to just be real clear. The story I'm going to tell, it is a true story, but it comes from another time and place. And it also comes from a family who normally stood with teachers, even if it meant being tough with the kids. When I was about to go into fifth grade, we had in our part of Kentucky, and in my little part of the world, we had an abusive teacher who was kind of the opposite of everything I just said. And, and this particular teacher who will go unnamed, there seemed to be nothing that this person wasn't allowed to get away with, and, and, and I was very afraid of being placed in the classroom with this teacher. I was a little bitty kid. I already told you I wasn't macho. I was a scrawny little thing. But I had something going for me. I had something going for me, and that something was my Aunt Nancy. My Aunt Nancy and I grew up together. We were about the same age, and even though we grew up like siblings, uh, I always called her Aunt Nancy, even when we were both little toddlers. My Aunt Nancy is, I have to be careful in case she is watching this, is a beautiful woman, but she was an especially beautiful girl, and all of the young men in our neighborhood would do anything for our family because of her. There was a guy named Rick. Rick was too old to be dating my aunt. He never dated her, but he still liked her. Rick was built like a professional wrestler. He was an iron worker, and he knew that I was afraid to go to fifth grade registration, so he volunteered to go with me. He put on a t-shirt that was about three sizes too small, which made his bloated big old body look even bigger. And all through my uh, registration, he flexed in unnatural ways and popped his knuckles. And then he looked at Miss So-and-so and he said, listen, I'm protective of my little brother. I love Eddie. And I just want you to promise me that he is going to have the best fifth grade year ever. Guess what? I did. I think about that memory when I think about what Jesus promises. Again, we read in verse 19, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. And he breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. We are not asked to face anything alone. Is the, cert, is the future uncertain? It is. It is very uncertain. And there is much to cause concern. But we are not asked to face it alone. But Jesus goes with us. I want to read the very last stanza of how great a foundation, how firm a foundation. I'm giving, giving our camera folks a challenge. Sorry, guys. I know I'm supposed to stay in one place once I get there. But I was afraid I'd mess it up, and this is too important. The last stanza of that verse. The soul that on Jesus still leans for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul that all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, blessed Jesus, ever-present Holy Spirit, we lean upon your all-sufficient grace to find within you the courage we need for the living of these days. Bless all who are troubled in heart this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing and respond to God? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his
Good morning, everyone. I know everyone is ready to leave, so I'll be very brief. My name is Bob Vornbrock. I have the privilege of serving as the chairperson of the Staff Parish Relations Committee here at Collierville United Methodist Church. And I have a very important announcement to share with you this morning. Bishop Bill McAlilly and the cabinet of the Tennessee Western Kentucky Conference work prayerfully together to make missional appointments to every church in our annual conference. As chairperson of the Staff Parish Relations Committee, I give thanks for the ministry of our pastors, Dr. Deborah Sutterth, Reverend Tondela Hayward, and Dr. Eddie Bromley, who continue to be servant leaders among us. I'm very delighted this morning to share with you that Deborah, Tondela, and Eddie will re be returning as pastors for the 2022-2023 conference year. And we give thanks for this announcement. You'll now join me in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, our living Savior, we give thanks for our church. It is a gift of grace to us. We are deeply grateful for the leadership of Dr. Deborah Sutterth, Reverend Tondrell Hayward, and Dr. Eddie Bromley, who will continue to serve us as pastors, teachers, leaders, and friends in Christ. May your grace be upon each of them and their families, giving peace and joy and confidence as we continue the new conference year together. Open our hearts and minds to receive the gifts you have for us in these days as we give thanks for what has been and anticipate what will be. Our life is in you, O oh God, and through the Holy Spirit we pray this day. Amen. And following this benediction, you will notice that the uh, Ukrainian national anthem is going to be played. You, some of you may want to remember to pray for the peace of the world as you leave, or you may even want to come and spend a few moments praying uh, for our very troubled world. Receive this benediction. You've heard me say these words to you many times. Nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in quite an absolute and final way. What are you in love with? What seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what gets you out of bed in the mornings, how you spend your evenings, what you do with your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, even more importantly, what amazes your heart with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love with God, and it will decide everything. Amen. As we leave this holy place, bless us with your boundless grace. Help us show your wondrous face to those who need your love. Loving, trusting, serving you by keeping Christ in into something new. This is our prayer to know Christ and to make Him known by bringing us